Welcome to the B Shifter Podcast. We've got Nick, we've got Terry, we've got Vance. We're hanging out today talking about customer service, which is a uh, great topic, one that uh, Bruno was very passionate about, and I know it makes us all better. So looking forward to digging into this one today and talking about some resources that we have for people to help them out with customer service within their organization as well. So first of all, how are you guys doing? I'm fine. He's dandy. We're fine and dandy. Oh, that's the... Uh, that's the go-to <laughs> vaudevillian uh, yeah. Ba -dum -ba -dum. Intro, intro. Yeah, right? That's an interesting shirt you have on there today. Thank you for bringing the shirt up. My, oh, oh yeah, my, let me get a better shot of that. There we go. My daughter and grandson bought me this shirt, and apparently it's Deadpool riding a unicorn cat with rainbows and all kinds of different colors. And... Um, so I've been wearing it for about two years now. Actually, probably time to put it away. But right. Their big thing is every holiday they give me a different kind of shirt that and kind of dare me to wear it. And this one I've had, I've received a lot of good comments. It's the first time I've seen it. So yeah, yeah, Thank it's you. nice. Thank you, Nick. What do you think of it? Two years. It's pretty good. <clears throat> yeah, I take care of my stuff, Nick. You do. Yeah. This is a shirt I got from uh, when I worked on Ladder Eleven. That's that's like thirty years ago. Wow. Yeah. I found it in the bottom of a box is why I still have it. Yeah. And my shirt was provided by Blue Card, but I am wearing an undershirt that is my FAFO shirt, oh, now nice. available at the B-Shifter store. Oh, dude, it's... <laughs> <laughs> do, you ever, do you ever feel like Kanye? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just influencing so much. You're an artist out of Clothier. <laughs> So, uh, get, are you going to start dressing Alice and uh, foamy things? Yeah, maybe I do already. Woo, yeah, baby, yeah. <laughs> follow me on Instagram. Exactly. Can we all get hats? <laughs> <laughs> Straight build. So, uh, customer service, I, I think, is a topic that uh, when Bruno introduced it to the fire service, it wasn't really a fire service topic. As a matter of fact, we go on a lot of calls, and our customer service was pretty poor a lot of times, and uh, you know. Uh, I always use the example you know, I'm in the firehouse one day and the phone rings and the captain answers it and says, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, is it on fire? Well, you got the wrong number then. Well, this lady called in distress because a raccoon had been ran over by a car in front of her house, and she wanted the SPCA phone number, and this was before the Internet. Right. Um, and just she was like, well, maybe the fire station down the street will help me. And uh, we pretty much told her we weren't going to help her. And it's like, well, that wasn't very nice. No. If we would have just given her the phone number or said, you know, the SPCA would have taken care of that and – it would have taken 30 seconds to be nice and, and be helpful. So we we tried to, to shift the paradigm after that and tried to treat our customers a little bit better. And, and a great guide for that is the customer service book from Bruno. So let's talk about that a little bit and some of the elements that went into the, to the making of all of that. Well, he had a... Uh like this customer service idea, I guess. Uh, you know, maybe we should stop looking at the people we deliver service to as victims and more like customers, and that may redefine the relationship a little bit between us. And I think part of it was that, is he was trying to de-victimize our customers somewhat. And, you know, because we were. We, we, and up to, and he said this, he says, up to that point, he says, we delivered service to a force of nature, he says the fire was our customer. He says we never. He said we weren't mean to people, but you know that wasn't the focus of our work. We were more of a, we protected the community against fire, not the people right. in it so much. And then <clears throat> he said, as far as like, because he was always a, like a student of leadership and managing things and stuff like that. The the comment he kept making is until. Uh, I figured out the co concept of customer service and that the fire department actually did deliver service to other human beings. And that's really kind of where the, I, I, I learned the most about being a, a leader and, and how that affected what we did organizationally. So, <clears throat> I mean, he came up with it. I remember, uh, I don't know, it was, I was a captain 
I had been for a little while, and he would have captains' meetings. Right. All he loved having captains' meetings. I think that was his favorite mm-hmm. thing was meeting with captains. Yes, because they were high enough in the organization that they would say anything that hit their mind, and you know they had enough protection where they didn't have to worry about being reassigned. They were union members. Oh, exactly. So he and he was really more of a union president than a fire chief. Yeah. So I mean, it was just the perfect deal, and and it was on B shift, so you had all the people that had some type of a head injury in the room together at the same time. <laughs> so he had us all captive, and he brings up this concept. And I, for, like, I don't know, 45 minutes they argued, oh, we blah, 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 blah. We already do this, blah, 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 blah. But it wasn't, <clears throat> it was a productive and positive meeting, I think, which right. kind of he scratched his head over and thought, man, the B-shifters didn't kill me over this. And yeah. So I think it, it, it just, he kept, pushing it out there, and he kept going with his meetings, and it turned into the book he wrote on it, and then it, it became a thing in the fire service. Yeah. I mean, if, you, so. if you look at the book, and we'll go into maybe a little bit of depth in the chapters, um, it's actually some of the the reasons he kind of made, made negative statements positive. Mm-hmm. Like, he heard some of the reasons why we felt like customers weren't important, mm-hmm. and how we treated them, and how we viewed them, and he kind of turned that around and made a positive statement out of it, and then wrote a section on that, and it, it made a lot of sense. But I remember those meetings, too. And uh, <laughs> I remember when he first kind of, because you would go down, you you wanted to hear Bernasini. I mean, it was a time in our career where I, when you were a fire captain, man, we get to go listen to the fire chief. And you go listen to the fire chief, and he opens up, and it's, I mean, he was a guru of, of innocent command, and we want to talk fires, and we were heroes and all that. And he opened up with, let's have a discussion about people and customers. And you could just feel, you could hear the room just kind of suck all the air, go, oh, what's he got for us now? But by the time you left there, and, and you an hour and a half later, you didn't want the meeting to end because you were still talking about it and you're, you're kind of moving the subject forward. But he was so good at that. And, and he would always ask the obvious questions. Like is somebody would say something negative about um, this, the customer service concept. And he, well, why wouldn't you, you know, he went back to that. Well, why wouldn't you be nice to him? Well, why wouldn't you treat them? And there's no answer for that other than, well, I'm going to be an asshole, so I'm not going to do that. And he always came back to that. It made a lot of sense for us. So, uh, you know, uh, as we were going through our Silverback leadership, we used the heck out of this book. I mean, we re, re uh, how we say, we repackaged this book and a few other books, but this is really one of the the baselines of that silverback leadership program because the customer, we start with first with the work and then we move directly into the customer, the inside outside customer service. So when he was talking about the customer, he was talking about Mrs. Smith, but he was also talking about how we treat each other Mm -hmm. in the organization. I think this book (coughs) focuses more on the Mrs. Mrs. Smith concept. Um, But yeah, that was coming along about the same time. When do you think? Yeah, he was. He wrote the book in '96, but he started talking about it in like probably the early '90s yeah. before it became a book. And then at that point, he was connected with uh, Ifsta more. He was doing stuff with them, so uh, they wanted to publish uh, the customer service book, and so they made it part of their essential series. So they called it the Essentials of Fire Department Customer Service. So they had the book since it was published in 96, and then we took it over, I don't know, probably uh, two or three years ago. We They weren't doing anything with it anymore, and it had gone out of print, and they had some copies left, and they didn't know what to do with the residuals that they had. So they contacted us, and we said, yeah, we want all that back. Thank you. And at the time, they asked, would you, you know, this was part, we were going to do some stuff with this under the essentials title. Would you mind taking that off? And we really didn't. We thought, yeah, that's fine. So we, the only change to the the book that we reprinted here uh, just recently is it's fire department customer service. So we lost the essentials out of there. And uh, when we reprinted it, we didn't do the spiral bound. We printed it like a traditional right. hard spine, perfect bound book. So, but other than that, the book, the paper's probably a little bit, but it's a better quality book than the older one was. So, and it, it's, <clears throat> it's the same book. In fact, <clears throat> when my dad was alive, we talked about revising it because 
Oklahoma had, and we thought, well, we'll take it back over, and you can do like a second edition. And he looked at it, and he says, I don't, I don't know what I changed in it, to be honest. And we started looking at it, and thought, well, no, why would you? It's, it's, <clears throat> it's there's certain books they've never changed for a reason because they're really good, and so we'll just keep it as it is. I mean, you put new stories in it and fresher things, but it's it's the same concept, and they're no better than what's there now. So. You know, it's interesting because now you, when we talk about customer service and we talk about Mr. Smith, it's everybody, nobody's surprised by that. But there was a time in oh, the, in the was, 80s, yeah. right, when I think it might have been the early 90s, but I'm really bad with time frames. But anyway, I, I went to a uh, Midwestern city to talk about fire attack. And this Midwestern city was trying to figure out exactly what was Boise. I went to Boise and they were trying to figure out exactly, you know, how to move forward with fire attack. So I was bringing the kind of what we were doing with the fire command piece. And um, they had invited the New York firefighters there, too. And they were coming in and they were talking about the New York system, which was different from ours. You know, they work off a task level system and ours was more of a decision making model and and you had choices not as much as we have today but there was there was a difference in the system and I went first so you have the the Boise command team and a uh, beautiful facility and a bunch of captains and and some firefighters and I get up and I start talking about the fire attack and the way that we would do it in Phoenix and at one point I said you know and then we the customer and they were all they were all listening pretty well until I said you and then you have the customer that would come up and they're like, "What did he just say?" I mean, the entire room kind of changed. Did he just call them customers? We call those taxpayers, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a couple other words. And I took <laughs> and I sit up there and I took some abuse from those guys. And you know the way firefighters abuse each other with a lot of love, right? And um, it was pretty interesting. I've never forgot that that that. I used a word that I had been using for years and years, and I used it outside our system, and people were, and the word was customer. And the people are like, oh, you can't call them customers. They're not customers. And, of course, they've transitioned from now, and they provide customer service, and everybody else does in the country. But this book will help uh, really identify the best way to, to kind of look at your customer, to uh, how you deliver that service, and really it's it's – still perfect well it's such a good reminder because i i think that there are a lot of industries where customer <laughs> service has been slipping pretty fast in the last four or five years a couple yeah oh. um you know we you can't get anybody on the phone no one wants to help you they just want to separate you from your money so i think with us reintroducing this to everybody and keeping us focused on why we're really here because we are in the customer service business, right? I mean, we're providing a service. We're not, we're not providing yeah. a good, we don't, we don't sell anything. It's, it's a service that we provide. So having a guideline to, to help us through that and, and also help educate some of our folks on why we want to behave in that way, I think is, is really yeah. good. And, and Bruno used to say, you know, if you wanted a plumber or you wanted a painter or you wanted somebody to work on your car, you would go out and meet a couple people and maybe interview them and maybe look up and see how well they they do or how they treat their customer. But when you get the fire department, the customer gets whichever fire company shows up that day. And then that fire company is representing the entire organization, in many ways representing the American Fire Service, right? And... Um, so they don't customers don't have a lot of choices when they when they ask for a fire department service. So we got to make sure that we provide a really effective customer service across the board. Well, it was <clears throat> he started in the early 90s. He broached the idea of customer service. They're not victims. Uh, and then he took that and then that the fire department would reinforce uh, those kind of uh like after action reviews right. where some crew delivered a high level of customer service to, to somebody. So that kind of became uh, recognized in the department as a direction we wanted to go. And so after two or three years of uh, being bombarded by a customer service radiation, you just didn't feel it anymore. And you thought, yeah. okay, it's the, it's the customer. I get it. He wants to go out and add value and, you know, core services first. And then if we can do a little something to, you know, make their day better. That's what you do, you know, within the context of what that going on with that incident. Well, <clears throat> so 
And not everybody agreed with it in the fire department. There were some people better at it than others. But I think it hit a milestone, at least in my mind, when I was at work one day and they delivered the mail. And it was Friday, so they delivered all the mail and it was payday. So that's when all the checks come in and all the mail gets put in everybody's slot. And so you sit down and you're reading the buck slip, which was tremendous because you were going to get to the back pages where all the drama laid. Mm -hmm. But there was a I had my check and there was a thing stapled to it. And I thought, what the hell is this? And I pulled it off and it was a booklet that was, I don't know, it was probably six inches by four inches and 20 pages long. And uh the union president had wrote a customer service guide. So Alan Brunacini wrote a customer service book, and then our union president followed that up a couple years later with a guide. So when you're on an incident, this is what you need to remember. And, you know, they're not an interruption. They're the reason we're here and doing what we're doing. And so <clears throat> I loved the visualization of that being stapled to your paycheck <laughs> and saying, you get this because you do this. Yeah. And you thought, yeah, th th that does it. That is a perfect thing. <clears throat> so, I mean, it just kind of, it connected the dot on the back end and it made it where, okay, I guess the fire chief and now the union president. Mom and dad. Yeah. Uh, I guess all the people who don't want to do this can line up over there and, and, and yeah, be ostracized by the rest of the fire department now. So what they did is they made it cool to, like, be a, a, a good firefighter, yeah, basically. It, it wasn't, a, like, a sissy well, thing to do to treat people nice. It was the right thing to do to treat people Let me people take that nice. back. What You were going to be a good firefighter, but now they were expecting you to also be a good human being. Is yeah, what it yeah. was. So the core of your service is I, uh, you're a good firefighter because you do this well, this yeah. part. You can do the job of a firefighter. That's what makes that. But the added value is really kind of what humanizes the service that you're delivering. Yeah. And there's parts of the book where he's he really tells us that in order for us to provide good customer service, we've got to be good at our jobs, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Skillful, execute a good outcome. Yeah. We can't show up and not know what we're doing. So yeah. don't... Uh, yeah, uh, an element of this is is being a good human, and part of being a good human is is being able to execute and have a good outcome and provide great service and know what we're doing when we get there. Yeah, I connect with the customer on a human level, and, because, yeah. and he would say it. He says, "Mrs. Smith has her kitchen fire. She's never written me a letter about the way we ventilated her house or the way we manipulated those turbojet fog nozzles. <laughs> That's never it. It's how quick we got there and how nice we treated her once we solved her right. problem." Is, is, is that we took advantage of people who got it early. And everybody didn't get that. I mean, if you're going to do staging, you got to all stage together. I mean, there has to be kind of a uniform approach in response to staging. Let me just use that as kind of a silly example, maybe. But when you say be nice, the whole organization isn't going to be nice at exactly the same minute. Not that they weren't nice before, but they really did not embrace that as a as, as much of, a, of an idea or a concept or a behavior. Some people did. Like anything, some people got it very early. And what we did is, is that we celebrated and publicized what they did. And those became a lot of the directive things in the program. Or somebody would provide uh, sort of social service, which is food, shelter, and transportation. When they did that, we, we, we would have a family that had a fire and were homeless. A battalion chief and two captains got their resources to put those people up, be sure the kids got to school the next day, uh, connect them to the resources that it took to do kind of medium-range recovery in the process. We would take those stories and we would distribute them throughout the organization so that those people became kind of the customer service heroes in the system. Well, the, the rest of the workforce would see that and, and, and would connect to it. Some were slower than others in the sense of, well, I don't know if I'm ready to do that yet, but at least it, it, it got people sort of connected and involved and thinking and, and seeing what was possible. And words, what does it mean when you say be nice? Well, what it means is, is if you have a family that's standing there and, 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 and they don't have any place to sleep that night, what it means is, 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 is provide that service to them and use the resources that we have available. And, 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 the, and the, the community was terrific in giving us those resources. You've been through the same thing in your departments. 
And people said, oh, that's what it means. Is it that if, if Mrs. Smith is, is standing there with a flat tire, kind of scratching her head, pull in behind her, change the tire for her. And and we we would we would put those experiences on television, we would write commendations, we would publicize that through the system. We would embarrass the people who did it, and I mean that in a positive kind of way, by, by thanking them and, and, and making that kind of more of a public kind of a thing. So it caught on. It's just, it, and, and it, it, I, it, sometimes it was, I almost can't, we can top that. Watch what I do on this one. <laughs> we did a lot of stuff on loss control. We bought smaller tools. We bought boxes. We bought salvage material. We bought... Uh, Carpet cleaners. We bought wet vacs. So you, again, you did the same thing. We, we would we would dispatch a special unit to help them with that. Didn't cost very much. It, it was, but it was added value that people really remembered. And it was the cheapest part, and it was the least expensive part that produced the biggest memory impact. So we started to say that that the 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 basic core service gets us in the door. The little extra is what they what they remember. And a lot of times the extra was just that the firefighters were nice to the customers. They were polite. They, they, they connected to them. They were patient with them. Uh, it, it wasn't that, that we delivered a, a huge amount of added value every day. Once in a while you got a chance to do that. And those are the stories that you would get in the newspaper and that people would tend to repeat. And, that sort of thing. and he talks about this is the way that you represent this to the outside. And he meant like your city masters. As he says, you don't have to do this, the customer does. And that becomes a very powerful loop then. I actually used all that uh, applying for jobs as a fire chief. When you're sitting across from the mayor of Houston or a city manager and they're asking you, what's different about you? And you are, what, what are you going to bring that's different? And you can start describing the, the qualities in that book and how you treat customers. You can just see their eyes light up. And not that the fire departments were doing a terrible job, but to have a fire chief saying, these are one of the values that I have that I'm going to try to instill down through the organization. Um, yeah, it, it works really well when you start talking about the customer in their terms. And he, he said that very well in the book, is that we see the customer, in, we see our job in our professional terms, and the customer sees our job in their emotional terms, and we got to match those up. Mm -hmm. That's that's the key to that. You know, I, I just think of that deal where you said about being a good firefighter. Yeah, man, you kicked that door. Good job. You kicked it in. But next time, try the knob. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, things like that. Do you just... Well, and that's part of the core service. It's like, no, don't kick, try before you pry. I mean, just yeah. good standard practices. So yeah. getting there. And the people... I don't know. This was kind of odd. But the people who didn't want to do good customer service tended not to be very good firefighters. Mm -hmm. they, they would, no, I'm going to kick the door in. Yeah. This is all about what my view of what this job looks like, what I should be doing. This is how I have my ego wrapped up into this and validate myself as a hero, which can be very distracting. And I it. think those people weren't much fun to be around at work either. No. Uh, they, I yeah. mean, they're angry at the world for whatever reason. Well, when they go home, they tell their family, call me captain. They, oh, Okay. Captain Dad? I mean, what, what? and that's one of the eight principles here in the book is don't disqualify others with your qualifications. Yeah, right. And that that's really to that end, right? Well, well and that and then it, it, it part of that qualifying the customer is, a, is a, he would say, and we've said over the years is a customer doesn't have to smell perfect. They don't have they can smell like urine. They can smell like vomit. They can be laying on a park bench. I know that's all difficult Two thirty in the morning. But your customers shouldn't have to qualify for your service. Okay, buddy, you're a little too angry, you're a little too drunk, you're a little too stupid. We're going to leave the scene and not provide any service for you. So that's part of that. Your customers shouldn't have to qualify to be delivered this service. Well, some people disqualify themselves as customers. You know, you, you get there and they're violent. Well, they, they're, they they're doing a certain set you. of things. They can't yeah. touch you. Well, yeah, I mean, they, there's certain people that are going to disqualify. And well, you're not a fire department customer. You're a, a law enforcement well, customer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that piece of it is is. But, but yeah. we shouldn't qualify the customer every time we arrive on the scene. You no. tell the story very well about the wiping the, the cancer patient. Now, there was a time in our career that we probably wouldn't, nobody would have done that. We no, said, that wasn't no, our job. Is, no, yeah. we're not doing that. But you, 
But because we had a fire chief that said, well, no, you can add value to people's, it's you know, and that didn't cost anything what we did. I mean, it was just part of the service delivery cycle at that point. Glove up and get it done. Yeah. I mean, that that's kind of what the thing was. You know, the other part of that is people say, well, you don't meet my expectation of the service I should be delivering. Right. And you think, okay, well, let's just, you get to do that all the time now, Jimmy, is from now on. Every shift, you're going to go on working fires and, and people that are in the process of dying. Every single call is going to be that. How long are you going to last? Oh, I'd love it. You think, no, no, man, you're going, to, you're going to be burned out nothing in right. five, ten years. It, it, like 20 dead a day, that's not what that looks like, pal. So you don't want to go to, what your, to your training level every single incident. I mean, it, it, it's... <clears throat> If every incident you go to, you have to be have a major rehab before they put you back in service, you're going to wear out very quickly. You're a gladiator. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, the best gladiators all got shit chopped off sooner than later. You <laughs> yeah. think, no, man. And don't disqualify as you're going on the calls. Just – and. If you're not going to do anything, just don't make it worse. Don't be mean to them or anything else. Tell them you, you, whatever. It's, it's have a nice interaction with them and disconnect. I mean, that's and that's what happened too. Is with our organization, there were some people that were slow learners with the customer service piece, so they would just take two steps back and let the people that really understood it just step forward. Yeah, I had a partner that a mm-hmm. um, uh, wonderful guy off the job. <laughs> Right. A lot of fun and got me in a lot of trouble. But at two o'clock in the morning, you don't want this guy as your paramedic partner. It's like, dude, I don't want to go in that house and fist fight everybody in that house because you're being an asshole. Stay on the truck. We'll be back out in about 15 minutes. Don't even go inside. Well, you saw that happen quite a bit. Hey, man, and if you're the captain of that truck, at some point you're going to have to talk with that guy and say, hey, uh-uh, yeah. we ain't d- doing uh, your customer yeah. service routine anymore, pal. <laughs> See, so that's like first level. Yeah. So, so once you went over that group of first level supervisors in the customer service field, it almost becomes unauthorized not to deliver some level of higher quality service. The, it, it, well, and Bruno's explaining to us that, hey, these people are having the worst day of their lives. That's why they called you. So don't expect them to pull up a chaise lounge and, and wave a flag and, and be happy that you're there. They're already having a bad day. Don't right. compound it by, by being a jerk and not treating them nice. I mean, I've, I've heard him say that so much. But we've got to remind our people that a lot of times. Absolutely. you got to remind them. Well, you have got to remind them. You do, and you have to come up with routines because we mm-hmm. do, we go on calls all the time where it's like there is we get there and there's nothing for us to do. I mean, they, they called us for whatever reason. You think, well, there, there's nothing. I worked at a station, and the engine went on a call once. It was during the holidays. And they got there, and the family said, uh, we don't have a tree. We'd like you to get us a tree. And, I mean, so and this was a, a very uh, independent, strong-minded group of engine people says what'd you do he says well we left and we got him a tree and we came back and the parents were indulging in intoxications to a level where they could have bought six trees and said, well, yeah. what'd you do he says we dropped the tree off and left that's what we did it was yeah and and so it's like they were stressed they had a little ptsd from that episode you said okay <clears throat> What are you going to do tomorrow when you get off work? Well, I'm going to go have breakfast with my friends and do X, Y, and Z. And I'm not going to call 911 for my basic needs. There's it's, probably it's, it's, a really good customer service kind of way to say, we're not going to get you a tree. You what know else what? you need? Well, you and, need groceries and or you something? Could, that, you, could, yeah. you could trace that back and say, why is the dispatch center sending you on get a tree? And what it was is they had some you know difficulty yeah. breathing yeah. front. And then it was, oh, no, she's gone. We need a tree. Right. But it was it was one of those stories that they told for a really, really long time. <laughs> it was it almost became an excuse for them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you think, how long did it take? Uh, it was about 15, 20 minutes total. <laughs> did you buy a tree? No, we went to a Christmas tree lot and we told the owner that the poor people needed a tree and they gave it to us. You and- know, the biggest thing you would hear when that was, <laughs> when that was happening, sorry, I'm shaking the table, is that well, I didn't sign on to be a babysitter. I didn't sign on for this. Well, yeah, you did. You signed on to, yeah, to uh-huh. ser- the, like you said, it's a service delivery system. And the fire chief says, we're going we're gonna to start taking care of the customer. You work for the fire chief, take care of the customer. 
seems pretty simple and obvious, but some guys had a real hard time with it. And then those people had a hard time, like I said, in the station. Some of them are supervisors. I remember a supervisor. We had a patient that uh, had a head injury, and the, the, from the cab of the truck, the fire captain assumed it was a intoxication of that patient. That He had his sister with him. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. It's raining, and the captain says, hey, he's just a drunk. Let's not worry about him. And it's like, no, we're going to take care of this guy. If you want to sit in the truck, Captain, sit in the truck. We're going to take care of this guy. We get him down. And sure enough, he had a head injury that looked like intoxication. But um, that guy probably went through, we talked about him a few times here, he probably went through his entire career and never got the customer service piece of it, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So some people, uh, it's, I don't know. Which well, and it, you know, and people acted like, well, you know, you have to go to all this trouble. And you think, no, you don't. It's, it, it's, it, I figured out you're going to go on the call one way or another. It, you're you're going to spend 10 minutes on this call. You can be an asshole or you can be a decent human being. It, it's the same 10 minutes. You're not going to d- deliver any more services when right. you're nice. You're just explaining, you're patient, you're, I don't know, you, you make the kid a balloon animal out of a rubber glove, uh, whatever it is you, you do. See, Smile at them. Yeah, you, you don't threaten them and tell them that they're wasting your time and everything else. It's like, okay, you know, this maybe try this next time. Drink more water. Get plenty of sleep. You know, just suggestions. We make good suggestions most yeah. of the time. But the other was like, oh no, I'm going to come and anyone who said I'm going to educate the customer. You no. thought, oh god, that's no. like telling your wife <laughs> to calm down. Mm. That <laughs> never works. No, it doesn't. Uh-uh. <laughs> <laughs> calm down. I think a lot of firefighters get the um, treating the customer nice, the the people that were that called nine one one. It's that other part of regarding everyone as a customer. I, I think Bruno identified that there was there was a, a whole group of people that's watching from the scene. So you had the patient, who's the the actual patient. You had the significant others, is what we call them. So their families standing around watching it. They got their kind of view of what's happening. Make them a make the kids a, a would you say a balloon animal? You got that. What we used to say, and it's probably not the proper term now, but the insignificant others were the passerby people in cars walk driving by looking to see how you're treating that person, whether they're on a park bench or whatever. And then the other agencies that we would deal with. Back then, PD or the electric company or the nurses at the hospital or whatever, those are all different groups of customers that are kind of watching you. And it just takes a second to kind of treat them all with respect, engage them a little bit. The worst thing we do is when we just blow somebody off. Somebody wants to know something. We, I don't have time to give you any information. I'm too important. This thing. And there are some times when you just got to treat the customer and not worry about them. But you ought to get back to them somehow or have somebody get back to them. Everybody's a customer, right? And then, I don't know, man. I've been in fire departments where the firefighters are real close and they're real tight. And the fire prevention folks... They're a whole different, oh, yeah, those are just fire prevention folks. Well, let's be nice to them, too. Like, I think that's what you're getting at, or that's the administrative staff. Let's treat them kind, too. So you start that, I think you start that being kind to everybody. Works out really well for you, and it doesn't doesn't cost a damn thing. Right? Have you, Nick, you're a fun guy. I've seen you crazy for about 40 years now. Mm-hmm. I've never seen you be mean to anybody. Well, you don't have to unless be. unless yeah. it was on purpose and they deserved it. Yeah, yeah that was mostly inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah that was jihad and with the other shifts. But, but yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, we would. No, you didn't have to. It was you didn't have to be mean to people. You could have a good time and all the rest of it. And then it just it became helpful for everybody when that was the organizational edict. Just, no, we're going to be nice. And Vance said it earlier. It's like we're not only going to be nice to the people. Outside, we're going to be nice to the people inside. Right. See, and that became the charges of all the bosses on in our organization. And see, there was a uh, a freedom and a joy that came working for an organization where you knew the rules and what yeah. and there was and they routinely said these five rules. If you break them, you can be fired for that. And it was obvious to everybody, and, and we knew what they were. 
And if you do your job correctly and everything else, you're going to be okay. Well, you could watch that and say, I knew what I could get away with and what I couldn't, I guess, to put it in those terms. But I also knew what the boss, how much power they actually had over me yeah. and what they could do. And I thought, okay, if I, if I am competent in my core services and I behave myself on calls, there's not a whole lot you can do to... Yeah. yeah, I can have all kinds of lunchtime observations because I have First Amendment rights. Mm-hmm. Bruno used to say, <laughs> "Bruno used to say, I want my firefighters sober and celibate for 24 hours." Uh, the, the, yeah, yeah right? those were like four of the five rules right. that we four couldn't break. Five. Yeah, but, but yeah. we had it. We came out. And the other was what to steal. You couldn't steal. You shouldn't. Yeah, steal. yeah. So especially from like. Uh, like from the city and from the people who you work yeah, with. Yeah, you can't yeah. go through the lockers because you yeah, that, ooh, yeah, okay. yeah, that was. Um, we we came mm. out with a uh, safety book at one time, and it had this really great two statements in it that would make sense for customer service too. And it was that, and I hope I say it right, but supervisors are not authorized to overlook safety issues, and command officers are not authorized to not follow up on those violations. So then you knew if you violated something of safety rule, and I think it was the same way with customer service, and you get held accountable for that or your boss calls you on that, don't be surprised by that. So it got to the point with customer service, if you treat somebody like an asshole, you know that, in fact, if you're on a scene, say you'd rove around and you go to a call and uh, you see somebody else acting like an asshole, you'd think, okay, let's see how this goes. Let's watch this captain. And the captain would hold them accountable in most cases. Not everybody's perfect. Not every system is perfect. But you say, okay, let's watch this. And it was sure enough right there. There was a lot of, that builds trust in an organization, right? You trust the bosses are going to hold people accountable. Because there's nothing worse to say, oh, I do all the right things, but that guy lets that guy get away with everything. No, I think it was pretty much accountability across the I worked <clears throat> with a pair of engineers in, early in my career. We had had a few shifts in a row where it was uh, more and more difficult to be nice, you know, just as you got on the truck. And so it was like uh, the sun was coming up and I was about done. And uh, one of the engineers took me off the side and says, hey, man, we got this. He says, "Uh, the last guy we had here was an asshole. And uh, thank you for not being that way. Last supervisor. Yeah. The last person who worked on this truck. And he says, we're going to take care of this, of Jimmy right now. You just sit here. It's just done season. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and and that was it. We got back to the station. He says, hey, that was, that, that, no. That, he says, you may have to pull me off once every year or two, but it was, uh, yeah. we take care of one another this way. We just kind of, they, they called it tapping out. And it was, and <laughs> that was the deal. And, and so you had a young person who's just starting who couldn't be me because, I mean, they, they, they were just trying to figure out what they were supposed to be all the time anyway. And then two older engineers who had years on me that were, they knew what was important in the thing. And and they were v- extremely competent in just the basic core mission that we did. But they were just a couple of chill guys that would make balloon animals and, yeah, <clears throat> seem to do very well in human relations with other people across all spectrums. Yeah. I noticed that with the be nice. The per, the people that were the nicest had the most uh, pretty, pretty boys and girls that they called friends. <laughs> <laughs> I recognize that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Life's been good to me, me so, so far. far. <laughs> Those are two different songs, and I only belong to one of them. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's talk about one more before we go, and and that is considering how what you are doing looks to others, because I know as a fire chief, this is when I would get the phone calls. I don't know if you'd get the phone calls. I don't know if you ever got those phone calls, but it's the crews out of quarters, and, and they're doing something. They're not delivering service. They're playing tennis. They're visiting the ice cream shop, and, and your dad even brought it up during the recession. It's not in the book, but... Hey, you know, it's a recession right now. Maybe standing around getting $10 lattes isn't really the, the, the right message you're sending to the community, especially if a lot of people were laid off recently. Yeah, don't wash your Corvette in front of the station. Yeah, yes, yeah that's yeah. probably not a good idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how about that one? Do you guys have any examples of, of 
you know, for, for folks who are listening or watching, because I know firefighters always had trouble with this one because there's one guy on the national circuit that would say, you know, let, let the boys be boys and let them sit in the, out in front of the fire station and, and uh, you know, shoot, shoot the breeze if they want. Well, that would generate during a period of time a lot of complaints. Yeah. Just yeah. guys sitting in front of the fire station for whatever reason. As a matter of fact, uh, there, there was a guy that I knew that was on a, a pretty exclusively paid on call department, and somebody swung up into the front of the, the apron because they were done training or done with their call or whatever, and just, just shooting the breeze before they go home. They weren't even staffing the station. And the, and the, the customer yells at him. It's like, this is what I'm paying for? Well, this guy was very smart and had emotional uh, EQ and and explain to him, hey, we're paid on call firefighters. We're just wrapping it up and we're going home to eat dinner now. So, uh, do you guys have any examples like that that I that would be helpful for folks? So, I had one that kind of went the uh, maybe a little bit the other way. So, when I was a fire chief in Oceanside, and this was two thousand and eight, we had a fire company that was right down on the beach. And what these, what this fire company did for their PT is they would park the fire company right there, the fire engine right there where all the people were, and they would take off for a run. And they would run a quarter mile, and they'd come back, run a quarter mile. They had the radio on. And I had a discussion with the, the, one of the city council members who was irate about that. And uh, I supported the fire company. I said, you know, they're on the beach. That's where the customers are. They're they're dressed properly for what they're doing. They're running up and down the beach. They're not getting too far away. I'm trying to bring all the positive things. It's a positive image. Firefighters in shape, doing what they need to do. They can respond from there. And he never did get that. So I don't know how that would play out nowadays. I don't know if that would be as... uh, as easy for them to do nowadays, you know. I, I don't know, Nick. What do you think? That just seems like for me that was a, it was like no. That's why I want them. They're out there doing exactly what they need to do. And this guy got fired up in me. Um, but that's but you can't do that and then do the other stuff that's really out of whack because then they tie that. See, I told you these guys there they are washing their Corvette out in front of the fire station. Those are the same guys running on the beach. So you got to kind of take one. And pull it over here and say this seems okay, and pull these over here and say these are not okay. And you got to give examples as a fire chief. You got to give examples. I use that one a lot too. How how what we're doing looks to others is the excessive celebration after a fire. And I don't know if you're. Yeah. I don't know if Bruno came up with that one, but I. Yeah, I think I heard. I don't think it's in the book, but I think he did it in a class once. And it's yeah, we're chest bumping, high five, and smiles because you know we just got some. We just tamed the beast. Spike the family dog. Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Smith is sitting there like, man, I just lost my house. What are yeah. these? guys no, doing pictures in front of fire station oh. in front of fires yeah active fires or just after the fires that was one of the like hey guys don't do that go back to the station type but don't do that because somebody's watching that now we just had an incident in our city here about ring cameras talk about how you look <laughs> to everybody else so you're never off a of video right now they're out front they're talking to a customer and the ring camera is recording absolutely everything. And now they're held accountable for what was happening on that ring car. Or, or we had one where they come up to the door as they're knocking and they're waiting for the customer to come to the door. The ring camera is recording what they're saying before they go in. And they're held accountable for that. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, my. Because the family goes back and they see the ring camera. Hey, See what these firefighters said about us? Mm-hmm. That's not good. Well, and now you got a video of it. I mean, that, that's that, and, and yeah, it's going to go somewhere. Well, and then usually what happens? Well, what can happen is there's an inquiry, a complaint made, and they say, "Oh, we never did that," and they don't tell them. Oh no, you're on video doing it. Yeah. We, we we have this, and so now they're playing games. Is they're yeah <laughs> processing it. Judge Judy says, oh, I see I got a monitor here. There's going to be a video. Mm-hmm. You yeah. don't find that out till you go to court. Well, see, and that should be something that you got to be familiar with that if you're working on a company. that Everybody's got, you're being recorded all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that sucks about society today. Is It's it's, so, it's the so, way the police solve all the crimes today. Your cell phone and cameras, just videotaping everything that happens in the world. And, that, you know, and... I don't want people to be paranoid, but every time a fire engine drives down the road, whether Code 3, 
lights and sirens are just going down the road. People are watching that fire engine. You know, and you we used to have, and I remember back in the day, I haven't seen it for a very long time. If somebody gets in front of you and they're going too slow and you're trying to get to a call, what do we? What did we do? Lay on that horn, man. And get right on yeah. their ass and just push them toward, and it's like, mm-hmm. don't do that. Yeah, the really nice engineers I had, that, that was one of their bad habits. Yeah, they, 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 a, come on, buddy. <laughs> it's not nice to scare the customers <laughs> when you're driving to the calls. Yeah. Right? So, uh-huh. so we would have a procedure for that. Well, right? and, and they said, well, you know, they're always watching you on a fire truck, and you think, no shit. We painted the thing red. Yeah. It's three times as big, and we put flashing lights and sirens on it so you couldn't miss it. Yeah. Oh, they're noticing us. Uh huh. We, that we, uh huh. We're There's Asian. 700,000 lumens coming at you. Yeah. Of course yeah. They're uh-huh. And children love them. Yeah. 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 Uh huh. I used to ride on the tailboard back in the day, and you'd pull up, and certain people would show their gratitude by showing you things. Their gratitude. Yeah. Uh huh. Their the gratitude. Attitude of gratitude. Yeah. Uh huh. So this book, that it's book. out, and it's the customer service book from Alan Brunacini. We just, we just, Scratch the surface of it. Oh, no, not, yeah. Even, yeah. not even close. Yeah, there, yeah. there is so much in there. And, and I think it's such a great help for anybody that's in a leadership position, whether, whether you're leading a, a small group, a large group, if you're the fire chief. So many tools in that book to help you out because I would, I would use each of those eight principles all the time to help us guide our customer service efforts. Oh, it's, and he says it's so much better than we have here. In that book. Yes. Well, and it just makes sense. I mean, you read the book and you think, well... Oh, why wouldn't you? Yeah, why, why wouldn't I do this? It's just, it's, it's yeah. But, but like you said, you could get that book and that could be a company project. Hey, let's go through the book together. Or it could be an organizational project. Let's go through this book together and make sure we're kind of understanding all these uh, concepts and working through them. Well, not only that, but the, the, the other part of it, you guys brought it up a couple times, is it's inside, outside. So, like, the strategic people in the organization reading that thinking, if I want to empower my people to do value-added customer service, then I have to treat them accordingly and then support them in such a way that they will go out and do that. Bruno was talking to a a well-known fire chief that I saw, and the light bulb finally came up on for this individual when he said something to the extent of, like, if you're going to do it for any reason, do it so your organization gets stuff. Like, if you can't do it because you're just going to be a good human, but you want to look out for your organization, maybe that's the reason to do it. I mean, there's there's several reasons that motivate us, but mm-hmm. uh, we're in yeah, the book. Yeah, but that, you're right, Nick. That, that applies. And I think that book um, focuses mostly on the external customer, but just every one of those uh, seven, eight concepts apply to the internal customer. Just Just put Firefighter Smith instead of... Mrs. Smith, and it well, works you, out perfect. And Terry mentioned the Silverback Leadership Program we're working on, which was all the leadership stuff he was kind of had assembled during his life. And uh, pretty much that book is the centerpiece of all of that. Yeah. You got boss behaviors, no-brainer management, A&P, that, and a couple other things. But customer service is... 80% of that program. And I mean, that's the timelessness of that book. That's why we didn't touch a word in it and thought, no, here it is the way it is. And in fact, the leadership thing we're putting together, we're kind of mapping out what the first module is going to look like with the work. And we have, we're putting the media together now. And that's kind of the, it identifies core and added value and our uh, relationship within the community and how to kind of maximize that for uh, the, the most efficient and effective operations we can do and kind of it's it's exciting there's going to be a lot of juice to it and it will do it off of scenarios like we did with blue card right. so there will be like simulations almost they did x y and z and that you know and that book is full of those so we'll just kind of expand on that and we see probably the next i don't know eight weeks i think hopefully we'll have something that we can start putting up and people can look in and see that but in the meantime like you said vance we got the books now and uh they're back they were never out of print but they were very hard to get because oklahoma really wasn't if still wasn't doing much with them so now we have them over we're going to put it out if you want to get these books you don't have to go to ebay and spend 180 bucks anymore is we're selling them for 50 bucks out of uh all day long 
$25 less than the last round I bought. And I had to buy one for each station. So, wow. it, it, yeah, it's going to save okay. some money. Yeah. So, so, but it's, and it's, it's going to be in print all the time. And it's the same basic core book. Nobody was, yeah. It, it's, you're getting what the grand Pooh Bob put out originally, which is, I think, of a very high value. I'd use it for a promotional exam. I mean, oh, yeah. It's just wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So, right on. Right arm. Right arm. Right arm. You know what it's time for? Time of stack. Yeah, here it goes. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Timeless tactical to truth from Alan Brunacini. And this week's <laughs> is losing your temper generally represents the incipient stage of rectal cranial inversion. Well, that's a nice way of saying that. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. <clears throat> Let's talk Art. about losing your temper at work. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> that and communication. Right. No, uh, losing your temper. You know, we had a guy, uh, I was a fire captain on a roving company. It was one of our adaptive response units. And we would travel around throughout the city and fill in where other guys were training and we would get a schedule in the morning. We'd call the shift commander. He'd say, in the morning, you're going to this side of town. In the afternoon, you're going to this side of town. So we would take with us our racquetball equipment, our basketball equipment, all our turnouts, obviously, mm-hmm. and, and one extra set of clothing and a lunch. You were like a caravan. Mm-hmm. We were a caravan. And I had these. So I get there, and I'd been there for a few shifts, and I finally had a captain call me, and he goes, hey, you guys are coming over because they're smart. They go, you guys are coming over to our side of town to, to this morning. I said, yeah. He said, well, you can't play basketball with us. I said, what do you mean? So you can't play basketball. We're not allowing you guys to play basketball. I said, what are you talking about, man? You're, we're buddies. What do you mean? He goes, you got a guy in that, you got two guys on that engine company. Every time you come over, the one guy fights with everybody. He fights with his own guy, fights with everybody on the team, and he goes, we don't want you to play basketball. So I know, no, this won't happen this time. So sure enough, we go, and I promise it doesn't happen. I talk to the guys, hey, don't get in a fight. Don't do this. We go there, and sure enough, the big guy starts arguing with everybody and getting all pissed off. And I finally have to call him to the side, and they're like looking at us like, told you. I said, dude, what the hell's wrong with you? He goes, hey, I lose my temper, man. I go, what do you mean you lose your temper? He goes, everybody knows I lose my temper. That's just my personality. Everybody knows I lose my temper. I said, dude, you need to find your temper. <laughs> and we didn't get to play basketball for several shifts until he promised me he wouldn't lose his temper. But everybody's like, oh, that's just the asshole of the group. He always loses his temper. You know, you may know who I'm talking about. He's about six foot seven. It's like, no, dude, you can't lose your temper. And it's just was so ironic that everybody knew that this guy was was the guy that was going to lose his temper. So there were certain guys that would play basketball, and they would uh, they would take care of Mister Temper, right? Oh yeah, uh huh. He, he would just he would go sit down and not play anymore. Right. Yeah, you think okay, we took care. Of, yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> heal your cracked ribs over there. Yeah, you know, exactly. Oh, uh huh. Yeah. So anyway, we didn't. We there are people that think it's just fine. Losing your temper is kind of a common thing. Oh, I know people lose their temper. No, it's not common. It shouldn't be right. And when you do it, right there, right. Oh, rect- rectal cranial inversion. Yeah, and you. It, it's probably you can't. <clears throat> I don't know. It's not 1985 anymore. You really can't be rolling around and no. threatening. And yeah, okay, you're going to lose your temper. We're going to introduce you to smut or Z. Yeah. Or, it just doesn't work. It feels good to say, but well, it would felt good to watch sometimes too. You think, okay, this guy has been it, 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 he's been building up to this for years, and it's oh. finally going to happen. Yeah. But you know, I, <clears throat> when I was at BC, I got uh, called to a couple incidents where they lost their tempers at work and uh three or four weeks later they uh went home for a couple shifts i to think, think that about was it. one of the seven you said you can't fight on duty you know you talk on the front end we talk about customer service chief brunacini we talk about inside outside customer service he didn't care and, and i've seen this and i tell people this i go no he didn't large fire department fire chief in the corner you could walk up there and walk into his office and say, hey, Bruno, you got a minute? Or say, hey, Chief, you got a minute? He'd get up from his desk, come around, sit down, talk to you. Customer service. 
I mean, he did it right there. And he knew who the knuckleheads were in the organization, right? He knew those guys. But he always took care of everybody. But he wouldn't tolerate everything. You know, kindness, don't confuse kindness with weakness. Yeah. No. Uh, don't be the guy that loses your temper a lot because Brunacini will. Yeah. Yeah. You ever see anybody lose a temper in a captain's meeting? Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, mm-hmm. he, he, will, he will correct you pretty quick. <laughs> Yeah. Doesn't allow it. Yeah, it was even more fun if like whatever you were doing involved shovels and yeah, manual labor and somebody started getting shitty. It was mm-hmm. like, oh, I mean, yeah. you tell stories about your dad. Where okay, picked you up with one hand and mm-hmm, that's what they tended to do. <laughs> yeah, you know, those people were not afraid of anything. <clears throat> they just. I mean, they're fearless. And I mean, it wasn't like going into burning buildings or anything. I mean, it was fearless of like uh, confrontations with other individuals. Yeah, they, they, I mean, just, you know, the toughest guys on the job would cower over, oh, you know, I don't know how to. I mean, it was. <clears throat> and it was scary sometimes. They, they just cut through and, oh my, uh oh, we're in a new place. <clears throat> and because. You know, I grew up with him. I knew what kind of what his tells were sometimes. And you could see where he was going. You're thinking, no, this guy's going to say this next, and it's not going to be pretty. It, when it, you that's, see that's, him that's what would back and put that finger like this. Ooh. Oh, no, 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 because then he would put it over. And once that went <laughs> his mouth, you thought, <laughs> if you're not ready to defend yourself, you need to not be in the room. <laughs> this is <laughs> this is going to turn into something you're not used to. And And... Older people would tell you stories about that from, like, the the uh, late 50s and early 60s. And <clears throat> I, I, Henry Jessen at George's Olay Bar, all the big, tough guys, and your old man, they thought they were going to do, do, do. And one day he just stood up and he beat them with a chair. <laughs> what? He took an overstuffed chair the captain loved and he beat the crew with it. <laughs> Really? Yeah, uh, that, that's when I learned to love him. And you said, Jesus Christ. <laughs> so Bruno did say in one captain's meeting, it's a, it's a beautiful one. I don't know if we've ever said on here before. You probably, a chief couldn't get away with it nowadays, but they were having a captain's <laughs> a lot meeting. Of stuff. We had a very, um, well, how would you describe him? The, the fire captain, he was an asshole. <laughs> and he was always grumpy and he disagreed with pretty much it. He was entertaining as hell, but he was crazier than shit. And he challenged Bruno on something uh, openly. And Bruno said to him in the captain's meeting, I wasn't there, but it, it, was, it really made the organization around the organization fast. He said, you know what? You and I have, in, he goes, and this guy was a fire captain. He said, you know what you and I have in common in this organization? He said, what's that, chief? He goes, we both gone as far and as high as we're going to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You couldn't do that now. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, well, I think you should try. And when he said that, that he, it, the guy he said it to just started chuckling. He said, you know, Chief, I get it. I think you're right. <laughs> oh, man. Well, that's a good note to end on, guys. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here today on Beat Shifter. Um, check the show notes. We've got a link to the new book that's out, so you can get that out of our store. Until next time, thanks so much for listening and watching. Be sure.